just a moment before we begin the program this evening, I want to say a special thank you to all the veterans out there. As most of you know, today is Veterans Day here in the United States. Tonight's guest is actually a combat veteran, but I wanted to say a quick thank you to all of our uh, veterans here in the United States, everybody listening, everybody who has family members who um, were veterans. Uh, My best friend's husband was a veteran. My husband was a veteran. My father, my grandfather, all these incredible people, they signed away their lives basically to help protect our freedoms here in this country. And what incredible people they are. They deserve the thanks. If you see a veteran, pay for their meal. Tell them thanks for their service. Shake their hand. Let them know that they're appreciated. It can go a long way. Welcome back to season three of my podcast. I am Amanda Blackwood, the survivor. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking called Custom Justice. For those of you who didn't know, now you do. Keeping in line with that, this entire season is going to be focused on interviewing other trauma survivors who did or plan to write about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame their past. Get ready to hear from some truly incredible people. Please hang on for a moment through this brief advertisement. This is what currently pays for the show. Of course, I will also take donations through PayPal to keep the show running, or you can show support by a simple book purchase. I have quite a few out there. Just look for books by Amanda Blackwood on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Your purchase does go to helping to support local organizations that help fight human trafficking also. Today's guest is Deja Arnold. Deja is an Army veteran who served in the Baghdad ER for 15 months during the surge. She's been published in the New York Times and Full Magazine, Volume 3. She's written about her own experiences uh, through a work of fiction that I am fascinated by and must read. Um, So I'm honored to have her on the show. Uh, Thank you for joining me, Miss Arnold. And how are you today? Thanks, Amanda. I'm doing great. Um, It is a beautiful day here in western Pennsylvania, tucked in the woods away from civilization. (laughs) I'm hiding out. (laughs) So is that where you're from? Is that where you originally grew up? Oh, that's a that's a very long story. So the short answer is no, I did not grow up here. Um, my dad was in the army when I was born. So I've moved every three years um, since then and started out. I was born in North Carolina and lived all over. And then I joined the army and moved all over. And uh, we have decided to settle down here in Pennsylvania, which is has been kind of a 20 year long dream of mine to own a small piece of land here in Pennsylvania. You say a small piece of land. I read castle. Tell me about this. What's this about? (laughs) So we, (laughs) it does indeed appear it's it's got turrets. It has, (laughs) it is just a big house on the hill. Um, I call it a castle. Um, It looks like a castle tucked in the woods with a giant wraparound porch um, and like an acre and a half of, trees and land and it's beautiful wow that sounds majestic that is really cool thank you so i know when we originally connected you had said something about how you had served in the baghdad er holy cow as soon as i read that as soon as i read that i knew that i wanted you to have a a, spot on the podcast and I wanted to have it specifically on Veterans Day so I'm really glad that you also wanted to have this aired on Veterans Day. I come from a long line of military folks myself my grandfather was Navy my father was Air Force my brother was in the Air Force for four years they wouldn't let him re-enlist we won't get into why Um, (laughs) I got one of those (laughs) (laughs) there's always one in every family right yeah (laughs) so uh, what kind of trauma did you have to experience and what did you overcome while you were over there in Baghdad? Yeah, well, I think uh, 
it, I don't know. It's, it's a weird world being just kind of being a woman in like a male dominant masculine career field, like even down to uniforms, it was um, masculine was professional and feminine was not professional. So in appearance and in actions. Um, so androgyny is what was professional for women. Wow. Um, but if you, if you dipped too much feminine, you would get in trouble for being unprofessional. If you dip towards, you know, too much masculine, then you were a dyke. And it was just, there's, <laughs> it's, it was just this weird place to be as a, as a girl. I mean, I was 19 years old and, and trying to grow into being a woman, um, but also try not to like call too much attention to myself but how much can you really help being a young girl um surrounded by a bunch of dudes you know um so the (laughs) the trauma that i experienced in the emergency room was trauma that i could rationalize and regulate um so i knew the technical ins and outs of human anatomy and, and how blood works and how oxygen works and how to fix the things that, that came in there. And then at what point um, you couldn't fix things. And then you just file those things away in your brain. It's like, okay, I did what I could and I couldn't do any more. I had validation from my team that said you did the right things. You couldn't do any more. And then you just filed it away and got ready for the next round. And it was, it it was that kind of trauma um, that was, that was self-regulated. Like you could rationalize it because you were at war. You chose to be there. You chose this profession. This is what combat looks like. Um, And I was fortunate enough to have leadership that did a really good job of just encouraging us and not freaking out. Like even when things were hairy, they had made it a point um, to maintain the cool for us because we were kids, you know. I mean, they weren't much older than us, but they were a little bit older than us. Um, and then the, the other aspect, a lot of it had, had to do with um, the people standing next to me. Um, and so where there were people who had like my, our, my best interest in mind, there were others who didn't, for lack of better words. Right. Did you feel like you were under somebody else's thumb or under a radar the whole time? I would say no. I think in garrison, so garrison is the times that we're not deployed um, to a combat zone. Um, So in garrison, where as a combat support hospital, we don't work in a hospital. We we work in, we call it the motor pool or where we kept all of our vehicles and our equipment. Um, So there was a bunch of downtime. There was less stress. Um, We didn't have a job to do until we deployed and so that's when you know idle hands um found their way around (laughs) i suck at metaphors by the way (laughs) just go straight for the gold if you need to um but yeah no i being being the new girl um in in a unit full of dudes it it was really difficult it was very hard especially um when there were people in leadership who Um, took advantage of that like you wanted the leadership to like you to include you and that included like after hours and being invited to things yeah Um, so yeah I hear that I've worked in male-dominated industries for most of my life including events and I was the person that never got invited to those things yeah, I was actually, it's really weird is that when I was in Baghdad, um, I didn't know, I didn't know when people were drinking, I didn't know when people were doing drugs, I didn't know when they were partying, I wasn't invited to any of those things, and, you know, honestly, I, I, I'm not mad about that. Right, you didn't miss out on anything. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So how has this, the the trauma that you experienced, how has it impacted your life to date? Do you still have residual effects? 
Absolutely. Um, what, what's crazy is that I, my, I, I know very intimately what my trauma response is both to like various different things. Um, I, uh, when I'm dealing with acute trauma, so like an injury or something, my kids get hurt. My kids are choking. My dog is hit by a car. I know that there is a point in time where I will break down and feel my feelings, but I know in the moment when it comes time to act that I can turn those emotions off. Um, I can stop being mom um, and fall back on my training which is it's very strange to to think like it's been since I was a medic almost 10 years since since I actually treated my last patient um but it's muscle memory it is something that doesn't leave you it's you know um it is that primal instinct to act so the fight or flight or flee um my my instinct is to you know stay stay for the fight and see it through and then at the end that's when i shut down wow so i've always had questions about the fight or flight instinct i spent a little time as a flight attendant that's the one time that i had a job that wasn't male dominated uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> they actually taught us in training that fight or flight and freeze mm -hmm. um freeze was the most common result when there was an air crash investigation or something along those lines where you, know, you need people to evacuate the plane and you're telling them to get out and people are literally gripping onto their their handrails uh -huh. next to their seats and they're refusing to move that absolute freeze and then you go into the psychology of the people who have experienced trauma such as my own with the whole human trafficking thing where you have a whole different level that mm -hmm. several of the survivor friends of mine calls the please. Not please as in please save me, please mm -hmm. you know, protect me, but please. You please the person who's putting you through this so that they stop doing it. Yeah. Do you think these are things that people can learn to do? Can they change how they react to things based on training? Um, I, so where you would say, please, I would say trust. Um, so if I were in a plane that were going down and someone handed me a parachute and said, I think you can do this, I'm gonna fucking do it because I trust that they trust in my capabilities to do it because my initial reaction isn't, um, you, you caused this and you can stop it. Um, that my brain doesn't go there, if that makes sense. Um, if you, if I was on a commercial plane and you came up to me and said, Hey, get off the plane now, I would, I would gather all of my children into my arms and they know, like, we've practiced this where I carry them both at the same time. <laughs> oh, wow. And we would I would gather my kids and we would up and, and do exactly, you know, like, like we're supposed to, because I trust that you are the professional and you know that this is the right thing to do. Um, I'm trying to think of another situation where it would be like, you can make it stop. Like if I tell you to, to do something, you know what I mean? Is right. there that that's not directly related to trauma? Pretty much everything is related to trauma these days. I've learned. <laughs> <laughs> so you did mention your kids. I, I'm sitting here trying to visually um, imagine. You're obviously not hanging on to teenagers carrying them out. Yeah. <laughs> how, how old but, are your kids? But God help me if I needed to. Uh, <laughs> my kids are nine and five, and um, and and they're amazing. Um, they keep me together. They keep me together. <laughs> <laughs> they really awesome. do. Um, and, and that was a big thing. I had kids um, my last year of my con my last contract with the military. And after my son was born, I decided to not re up and sign another contract and to just get out. And at 10 years, they say that's the point in time you either shit or get off the pot. Um, yeah. 
you you stay for a full career or you know you you get out and i thought i could be one of those combat boot moms and i it wasn't for me i didn't when you're in the army you don't own anything um, yeah. and that includes your your space your family your time um, at any point in time anyone can come in and say all right let's go or okay you're moving um yeah and there's there's nothing you can do because there's a thing called chain of command like there's no autonomy in the military and i once i had a child um it it was not what i wanted for my son and my husband and my my life it was it was definitely hard as a military brat growing up that way my dad was air force and we'd move on average every few years or so I learned to not build connections with people because of it. My husband, in his first marriage, they had a couple of kids while he was in the Navy. And he was doing the same thing with his kids until finally he's like, after 11 years he was in. At 11 years, he said, I'm done. I'm not putting my family through this anymore. I'm getting out and I'm doing something else. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of him for making that decision. My dad stuck with it for 21 years and it was brutal on us, all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, I actually joined the army to kind of bridge that gap that he, it, the military created. And I was like, oh, if maybe if I can have this common thread, you know, of a career with my dad, that was, you know, this career was such a big part of his life, then yeah. maybe I could then be more of a part of that life. And um, I mean, I guess it worked in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, but at the same time, it, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> didn't it didn't um you can't make people who you want them to be i don't think you know you meet your heroes they say they say never meet your heroes because they're never who you think they are yeah and well my dad loves me and he's you know stays in contact he's he's not who i thought my dad could could be or was right yeah i hear that too man we've got some parallels <laughs> damn right <laughs> um so weird story growing up my my mother was so in love with my dad they met in high school and my dad was the actor and my mom did the set designs in high school oh. and so they lived in different worlds dad was like an upper middle class family my my mother was um like lower class and and for all intents and purposes they shouldn't have gotten together but they did and my mom just clung to him clung to the life that she was leaving um or, or clung to the idea that she was leaving you know this her life behind and and fulfilling her wildest dreams and so when dad was away in the military she everything was she idolized our father and then in turn we idolized our father and we said we made signs we celebrated when when he came home and then in the later years when he wasn't gone away like we had to clean the house before dad got home we couldn't eat dinner until dad got home like everything just revolved around dad and while my mother was there like the one who you know consoled us and took us to school and managed all the things in the house and really was the one there for us to raise us we still we, she diminished herself in our eyes because dad was the epitome dad was the pinnacle of the family wow um and then for me as a middle child like i just kind of was in this mix and i wanted nothing more just to be recognized and not only recognized but i wanted love I wanted the same love that we gave to my father like I wanted that type of love but I wanted it from him like I wanted my dad to be excited when I came home or to you know celebrate my my big wins my promotions and things like things like that and it, it never happened never did like to wow. this day, um, so a lot of my writing career um, is met with with criticism, which is his way of being a dad and offering advice. But for me, it's just like, can you just say, wow, congratulations? Or when I tell you that we're buying a castle in Pennsylvania, you you don't 
give me all the, you should look for this and the home inspection and look for that and the financing debt. Like I've bought more houses than you have at this point. Like just be <laughs> happy for me. Um, and so like all these things that I've done, like I don't regret having such a high standard to try to live up to because it has helped me build, you know, the life that I have and the comfort that I have. Um, but at the same time, it was never, you know, it was never how I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I had a hard time with that whole acceptance thing when I was a kid. I remember, um, so I was put on Ritalin against doctor's orders when I was very little. I took myself off at 15. Mm-hmm. When I did that, going through drug withdrawals as a 15 year old kid mm-hmm. and nobody knowing about it, my mm-hmm. parents took me to a therapist. And for a long time, because of this woman, I didn't trust therapists. One of the first things out of her mouth was, well, your dad just doesn't like you very much. If you want him to like you, you need to like what he likes so that you can have common ground. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds <laughs> sounds about like my little fucked up adventure. <laughs> yeah. What, what is wrong What the fuck people? is that? <laughs> Like now it's like, and I feel like now raising children, it's like, I need to know all about fucking Minecraft because that (laughs) is how I'm going to relate to my son. And like the things like my, my parents never apologized to me if ever they were wrong. Like they never, never apologized. And here, like I, I accuse my, my five-year-old of being dishonest or trying to hide something. And then I come to find out that I was the one that was wrong. And I am completely shattered and heartbroken (laughs) that I put my little five-year-old into this position to feel like she wasn't trusted. And I'm like, I have ruined this girl for life. I'm paying for (laughs) therapy. I'm not even paying for college. Like, (laughs) And I know, I'm like, then my parents, these, these things never crossed their mind. Um, and, and if it did, it was never conveyed and it's still not conveyed to this day. So. Wow. Yeah. My parents, one of the things about being who we are, I think is, is sometimes that we have to accept the apologies that we will never receive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Before the pandemic, my my mother went to jail for something that wasn't her fault again. Um, And it would (laughs) never be her fault. And I was like, Mom, you go to rehab or that's it. And she's like, I don't need to go to rehab for anything. So guess what? guess what? You're making this choice. This is you being a horrible person and cutting your mom out of your life because I don't need to go to rehab. And I did. I I cut her out for a while. And then the pandemic hit. And and it was like, if this is what is keeping me from, you know, at least my kids knowing who their grandmother is, like, then I don't think I'd forgive myself if COVID took her. And of course, you know, she, yeah. she made it through COVID just fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I cut my parents out of my life. I, I, I haven't seen them since 2009. I haven't talked to them since 2013. Mm-hmm. And I still won't even check on them on Facebook. I have wow. friends that do that for me, yeah. people that I grew up with. And they'll drive by and go, yeah, I saw your mom and dad out in the front yard today. I guess they're both still alive. That's the oh, only contact I have with them. All yeah. right, cool. Now I can move on for another three months. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> Huh. Yeah. So during your recovery from all of your um, experiences over there that were traumatic for you, did you find any services or resources or people that really helped you to get through all of this stuff? Um, I really think the big turning point for me, and you think it would have been leaving the military, um, but like my whole life was spent leaving. So I was pretty good at that. Um, I think when I stopped trying to run away from, I might cry, excuse me. (laughs) I think the moment when I, when I stopped trying to run away from myself, like when I stopped trying to wipe the slate clean and reinvent myself instead of just stopping and looking in the mirror and saying, Hey, you got a little dirt on your face, girl, (laughs) fucking wash your face. Um, you know, or, 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 Hey, this, 
this habit that you have of when, you know, your husband makes you upset and you manipulate him to make him feel bad about it, that's pretty toxic and, and borderline narcissistic. Um, and maybe you should work on that. And it, it was just mm-hmm. stopping and, and looking in the mirror and being like, fuck, you know, I'm messed up. I'm messed up. And at one point in time, these things helped me survive. Um, they got me through my 10 years in the military and my, you know, teenage years of running the streets. And, um, but, you know, I didn't need them anymore. I didn't need these toxic traits. I didn't need people manipulated in order to help me because I had a husband who loved me, who wanted to be there and didn't have to be manipulated to be there. Um, Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. It was, it was fucking hard is what I Oh, well, yeah. Because you don't know what you don't know. Um, but then when you learn it, you see patterns. Um, you see patterns and in, in people who do it to you. So my sister, this is a, an example of something, um, just kind of a habit of assuming what someone's thinking and then reacting based on that assumption. So I would assume my husband was being critical of something and then I would get angry with him and and treat him as if he had said that specific thing to me when in all honesty I had just made it up in my head so maybe he made a comment like um um yeah I can tell you're working a lot and something like that that just means that you're working a lot um and then I would take it to mean that he thinks I'm cheating. He thinks I'm, you know, paying attention to somebody else or something else and that he's not important. And then I would get defensive based on that assumption and then attack him for it when it had nothing to do with anything. You know, Mm -hmm. it was just a conversation. Um, And then my little sister would do this too. So she would send me a text message maybe while I was working and I wouldn't answer. And she'd be like, well, I take your silence to mean, and it would be something ridiculous, you know, (laughs) (laughs) like you hate me forever and wish I would die. And it's like, uh, you're, you're projecting (laughs) what you think onto me, which is not remotely true. Um, And how, like, can you read my mind? You can't read my mind. These things aren't true. And so it was trying to find these little nuanced habits, these little toxic habits that a lot of people do. It's just built into our survival. Like in the military, I had to anticipate the next order in order to stay on top of my game being a female in the military. So I had to anticipate what people were thinking and what their next request would be. And then doing that in a relationship, but doing it, you know, in a negative light um, did not serve any purpose at all and then pissing people off. <laughs> right. Well, it sounds like you're pretty lucky to have that awesome husband of yours, though. Oh, yeah. We, we've stuck each other out. Like... <laughs> <laughs> We sure did. We did. Um, I'm very lucky um, that that we're not we're not going anywhere. Um, I from the moment that we started dating, like I I had not looked at another man. Like I remember going to a new unit and they thought I was a lesbian because I just was not. There was no. I didn't joke. I didn't make like lewd jokes. Um, I didn't pretend to flirt with anybody I was just I was strictly business all the time and in the time I was in the military um it was before you were actually allowed to be gay in the military Mm -hmm. so people just assumed that my complete like ambiguity of of you know sexuality was because I was gay and not because I was very married like I was the marriedest married person (laughs) (laughs) zero interest in anything else like I I found my person and I'm done that's freaking cool man that is cool (laughs) yeah I'm I'm feeling like that about my husband we just our wedding was uh, January of this year so a little bit more than six months ago now Oh wow congratulations thank you I've dated a lot in my life I've had a lot of boyfriends I've had a few husbands in the past (laughs) this man is the greatest man I've ever met Okay. He's incredible. And I'm not saying that because he listens to this podcast because he doesn't even <laughs> listen to the podcast. No. Yeah. 
I don't think his family <laughs> listens to the podcast either. So we're safe, but I love that guy. Uh, <laughs> it's good. Yeah. It just, we, yeah, been through, been through a lot. Um, but yeah, we're still going strong. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Living in your castle with your kids. Exactly. Living the a dream. <laughs> Except he, we've got to mow this yard. We can't. Do, it's it's a two person job. It's huge. And oh it's, boy. It's on a hill, and it's. <laughs> no. uh, you got to get a riding lawnmower. You're old. You're nine enough. Nine year old is old enough, right? Yeah. Oh no, we would roll <laughs> a a riding lawnmower down the hill. It's how we live on a hill. Oh geez. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot different than uh, Denver. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. <laughs> we, I mean, there's. I don't really miss living in Denver. Um, I think moving to Pennsylvania, not just because it was a 20-year dream come true, um, but I, I missed grass and trees. And and I grew up, um, I didn't grow up anywhere, but my dad's family is from Western Kentucky. So if we ever went home, that's where we went home to. Um, and then in Denver, like there's, there's no grass unless it's irrigated. There's no trees unless you're in the mountains and Denver is an hour away from the mountains. A lot of people don't realize. I actually, I am as far West in Denver as you can possibly get. And the mountains are still like 20 minutes away. Right? Isn't that ridiculous? I, then I know exactly where you live. <laughs> I miss yeah. it. I, I live there. It's the longest I've ever lived anywhere in my whole life. We lived in our home um, by the airport for seven years. And it's the longest oh. I've stayed in one house. Wow, that's Never. out where the airport used to be, right? The Stapleton area? No, so we're a little further towards the newer one, so along okay. the, the E-470 corridor. Gotcha. Yeah, when I first moved here in 2016, I moved over to where the airport used to be in the Stapleton yeah. area where all that stuff's built up now. Now it and, is, yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of sliding down the hill, um, kind of like your mower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, crime rates are going up everywhere around here lately oh, oh my yeah. gosh it's crazy it's getting harder to, harder to live out there oh yeah yeah absolutely we're having broad daylight catalytic converter thefts in trader joe's parking lots oh my people goodness people have only been parked for 10 minutes yeah. yeah i'm making quick work of it then yeah just recently we had a uh, 14 year old young man that was murdered in a community center parking lot it was really close to home. It's 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 scary. It's getting really scary. Sorry. Um. Let's let, <laughs> let's get off of this this crazy. Well, trauma. well, no. We can <laughs> let's stay here for a moment because um, like in light, I'm gonna cry now. <sighs> but in light of it being Veterans Day, um, I recently, like extremely recently, like it hasn't even scabbed over yet. Um, lost. Um. A, a guy that I served with who was like my battle buddy um, when I lived in uh, Fort Carson, which is just south of Denver. Um, <sighs> Staff Sergeant Andrew Peary um, was an Army veteran that I served with, and he became a deputy sheriff um, in El Paso County, which is down in the Colorado Springs area. And he was responding to um, shots fired in a residential area and he was shot and killed um, on oh. duty. And uh, wow. so, so a lot of people, Veterans Day is for celebrating everyone who has served. Um, and Memorial Day is, is the day that we remember those who, you know, made the ultimate sacrifice and are no longer with us. But people, people like Andrew Peary, he, I didn't trust a lot of guys in the military, but, but Perry was probably the, the kindest, most gullible person <laughs> I ever met. We played so many jokes on this guy, uh, but he was always good natured and reliable. So when my son was born, he came to visit me in the hospital and uh, mm. he also took, took on my workload um, while I was on maternity leave and made sure that all my jokes were taken care of while I was gone. Um, until I got back and he, he was a good friend and, uh, now he's no longer with us. So, wow. sorry. I'm so sorry for your loss. Yeah. 
And I, my heart and my prayers go out to Staff Sergeant Andrew Perry's family, too, because this has to be absolutely devastating for everybody who loves the man. Yeah, he, he was great. He was yeah. a good guy. And, um... And I, so it's really weird being, having moved around and not made those lasting connections. Like I haven't talked to Sergeant Peary since I left the military 10 years ago, um, or not 10 years ago, eight years ago. So I haven't spoken to him in eight years. Um, and I kind of felt when I got the news that it, it wasn't my grief to have that it, you know, I, he wasn't missing in my life because he hadn't been there and uh but it was then like a couple people reached out to me and they're like hey i thought you should know and i'm like thank thanks for thinking of me i don't think i'm okay and they're like i'm not okay <laughs> and they were in the same boat like we hadn't talked to to Perry in years and and yet he left like he was a good one like he didn't deserve this of all of us like he should have been the one to thrive he him and his wife his wife megan has ms and he has taken care of her for years and wow. it it is it's truly a loss and it is devastating but i also know that that he touched so many people and that it's okay for me to be sad um because that just, you know, speaks to the kind of person he was and he should yeah. be remembered and should be celebrated and should be mourned. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my take on that. Yeah. What a great guy. Yeah. He was a good dude. Yeah. Yeah. That just sucks. Yeah. So, I mean, that qualifies as a sort of trauma too. Not somebody that you were close to, that somebody that not romantically, but that you loved. This guy was like family to you, it sounds like. I yeah. Mean, and and all of your brothers and sisters are and and even yeah. because like I've moved every three years since I was born, my friend from fifth grade holds the same weight to me as my friend down the street today. Because I have these people in my life for just a clip that they all kind of hold the the same footing and so when I lose somebody it could be the person who was just down the street or it could be somebody I knew in fifth grade and it still affects me um because they all hold that same weight and I I don't know if I was under the illusion that like when I got out of the army I I took myself out of that, <laughs> that trauma line um but you don't um yeah you don't. Yeah, it. I think it's just weird because, like, when you're in the military, you have to accept that you placed yourself there, um, and then you can <laughs> rationalize loss. But then, out outside of that, or when it's um, like your best friend, if it is your best friend, because um, right. I actually did lose my best friend while I was in the military, who she was not in the military, and um, her live-in boyfriend um killed her on christmas morning oh while i was deployed to iraq so i couldn't even come home right. to to pay my respects because she wasn't family and uh and, and you'd think if anybody would understand the need to be there even if it's not a blood relation it would be the military <laughs> Yeah. I mean, rules are rules, because yeah. if that were the case, then uh, everyone would take time off for every, you know, bump in the night there was. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, but they were they were very kind and understanding. And so I got some time off in in uh, Iraq from work. But yeah, it was that was probably the hardest thing that I've ever had to go through. My husband was deployed to Afghanistan <laughs> while I was in Iraq, and Sam had passed away. And so there, he, I couldn't even get a hold of him to be oh. consoled. Like I, my whole support system was shattered. Like, wow. um, yeah, so that was the hardest thing that I ever went through. But having that experience and it 
being the measure of the hardest thing that I've ever gone through has helped me get through hard things um, like working in emergency management during COVID. <laughs> when everyone's exhausted and scared and tired and I'm bringing everyone coffee with a smile on my face like <laughs> I get to go home at night I'm happy <laughs> I'm just happy to be here let's do this uh, I, I hope they caught that guy and he's doing a long long stretch uh it wasn't long at all actually oh. um so he he waited there um until the cops arrived and he um he did suffer from ptsd um and had suffered from ptsd and so he only got wow. 15 years and he should be out in three years if he hasn't gotten out early wow yeah yep yeah. Yeah. And I know you have uh, levels of PTSD yourself from experiencing trauma. I mean, everybody does. Do you, do you hold him accountable more than the law does? I don't think about him. Okay. I don't, I don't have emotions. I, there, there is a hundred percent complete apathy to this person. I don't care if there was a reason or not, because I don't have the emotional capacity to give him any energy good good None. for you it, is it is that good i feel like i'm just avoiding the situation but there but what can i do what can there is nothing there's there is nothing i can receive from his situation that would give me what i want yeah so i don't i don't give him anything well i mean I've heard it said so often, and I don't remember who originally said it. I, I, I think I know, but I'm not going to misquote myself. Um, <laughs> that the opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. And it sounds like uh, you are absolutely indifferent to this guy. So you don't, you don't care. Uh -huh. You just genuinely do not care about him. He holds, he holds no bearing and no weight on your life. And I think that's a huge part of healing, honestly. Uh -huh. Uh, being able to understand what's important, your friend's life, and being able to understand what's not important, him. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it took me a long time to get to that part with my former trafficker to where I'm not even angry anymore. It's like, you know what? I just don't care. Mm -hmm. You're an evil person that has nothing to do with me anymore. And, you know, I hope you don't do it to anybody else, but... Eh. Yeah, I'm just going, I'm going to walk away. I'm going to yeah. walk away. And like, heaven help this man if he ever reaches out to me. <laughs> no. I, mm -mm. no. Uh, hopefully he knows better than that. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Wow. What's one thing that you wish you could tell somebody else who's going through what you had to go through? Man, keep fucking going. Just, just it won't it won't always be this bad yeah and don't don't prescribe to your negative your own negative thoughts okay push push them out to get them out of your brain if your brain allows it allows you to choose a positive then cling to that. And if your brain does not allow you to change your negative thoughts to positive ones, then go get help. Go to therapy. Because the truth is, this feeling, these feelings, these horrible events that happen, um, they they pass. They get easier. The, the light shines. And it's not... The last thing I will say to somebody going through this is that it is okay to be happy in the midst of horrible things. You don't owe anyone your your sadness, your mourning. You you don't owe them that. You deserve to be happy. And it is okay to be happy no matter your circumstances. And it's okay to smile and enjoy yourself. Even if somebody else is suffering, you need to take those moments and steal them wherever you can. 
Well, that's beautiful. And it's hard for some people to understand how somebody can still smile while experiencing some of the worst things they've ever had to deal with in their life. But you I think it's it. part it's, of life. It is. And you, you take a moment to suspend, you know, the grief to smile. And, and it's those moments and you feel guilty for being happy, but at the same time, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. Yeah. It's called yep. self, self-care. <laughs> yep. Self-care and in some cases, self-preservation. Yeah. yeah. There were some times during the worst part of my trafficking where there were fi- pictures of me taken where I was smiling and I looked truly happy. Mm-hmm. And in those moments I was. It's not like the entire time I was being trafficked was one moment after the next was complete torture. There were good moments in there where I had a hot meal or Mm -hmm. the love of a child hanging out with me. I got to read books with beautiful moments that they deserve to be looked back on with fondness and to realize that, yes, you were happy in that moment, even if you were absolutely miserable for 99.9% of the time. Yeah. (laughs) There were moments of joy, moments of happiness. Yeah, laugh at a damn joke, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and the people that think it's not okay to laugh at a joke tend to uh, strike me as people who are not yet feel uh, healed from their own traumatic experiences, whatever they might be. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. What's the name of the book that you uh, were telling me about and how does it relate to your experiences? I cannot wait to read this book. It's on my to be read list. So I, I, I'm an author. I have, um, I think seven books out now. Uh, my latest book is, um, is, is called dirty bombs and it's about a mom who's deployed to iraq and the enemy result resorts to biological warfare which creates uh the zombie virus so i i was before the pandemic i was helping a friend of mine write a mash reboot called cash combat support hospital and um at the time that we started writing the, the, the pilot episode um I had watched this show called 68 Whiskey, which is uh, the the nomenclature for a combat medic. And I was I watched this one episode and a female medic came into the emergency room. She was a flight medic and she had made a mistake and she hadn't realized she made a mistake until she got into the emergency room and realized that her patient had passed away. And I like that hit me so hard. And it was like... <laughs> I, I wasn't ready. I guess I, I thought I was ready. I wasn't ready. Um, but then I decided to um, write all the nightmares that I had um, when I read World War Z while I was deployed. And then basically I just had stress dreams about zombies taking over the hospital. And it was a lot easier to write than actual real life, like non-science fiction um, events. Right. So that is what um, Dirty Bombs became. Wow. I, I, I've i been obsessed with zombies for many years now. And I got to say, Max Brooks, World War Z, it's one of my most favorite books. Max Brooks is a brilliant author. And most people have no clue that he's Mel Brooks's yes. son. Isn't that funny? <laughs> it is so funny. He also, like, recently uh, released a Sasquatch guide <laughs> to Sasquatch <laughs> hunting. He cracks me up. Um but yeah, I think the one thing I didn't and I mentioned this in my in my book is that uh in uh, World War Z the the zombies ran. They could run. And right. I I prefer walking dead zombies who decay and are slow. Right. And uh so in the very beginning of the book she's like, "Oh, thank God." Max Brooks was wrong or Brad Pitt. I think I said Brad Pitt was wrong. They don't run. Um, Yeah. So, yeah. It's like the difference between Dawn of the Dead, the original and Dawn of the Dead, the remake. If you've seen both of those, there's a huge difference in the way they amble and shuffle in the first one versus one wearing Nikes and sprinting at you in the second (laughs) one. (laughs) That's great. So do you have a passage from your book that you'd like to share? I would. And it touches on quite a bit. So um, I do want to set up is kind of a 
trigger warning. I, I imagine this whole episode is one massive trigger. Um, but I will talk about um, for combat veterans, indirect fire and combat casualty care, as well uh, mentions of suicide and just kind of giving up. But to set up the story, it's in a semi-temporary combat support hospital in southern Iraq. Staff Sergeant Miranda St. Clair's mission changes when the enemy resorts to biological warfare, releasing a zombie virus on her combat outpost. And this is an excerpt from Dirty Bombs. The gurney tipped head up as Miranda intended. The deceased soldier slid from the rickshaw to the ground next to the near dozen other Americans. The morgue was filled by noon, and there was only one ICU nurse left unaccounted for. Sergeant Crawford, Miranda yelled in the metal trailer. Hey, St. Clair, how are you holding up in there? They'd always been friendly, but not quite friends. There was worry in Crawford's eyes. Unlike Miranda, who was geared up in full battle rattle with her body armor, helmet, flame retardant gloves, and eye protection, Sergeant Crawford worked in just her digital pattern uniform pants and a tan t-shirt. How many people do you have helping you? I can have Johnson bring MREs when he's back from detail. We're also expecting more incoming mortars. You should at least throw on your body armor over your shirt. If I get hit by a mortar, then so be it. I'm down to one generator to keep this more remotely cool, and these bodies are getting heavy. I can't move in that gear anyway. And these three soldiers I have helping me, they'll be done soon. I can send them to you if it'll save energy, but I'll need three new Joes after lunch. Being around the dead so long wears these guys down real fast, and I don't usually notice when they aren't okay until it's too late. Taking a second to carefully word her next statement, Miranda went through her mental inventory of what she knew of Sergeant Crawford. It was clear the woman was giving up like a passive suicide by refusing to wear her protection from the incoming rounds. Miranda had a ton of experience with soldiers who felt there was nothing they could do about their own deaths. The Army even certified her to train resiliency to her peers. But ultimately, dead soldiers had become far more dangerous than the empty fighting positions they left. Anyone resolved to their own end meant another potential hazard. I didn't see you on the Black Hawk assignments. Don't you want to be the first ones out of here? My entire profession is based on one core value. I'll never leave a fallen comrade. Crawford answered, looking at the ground. I'll likely stay back to make sure the KIA make it home to their families. Miranda scanned the rows of evenly placed bodies covered in white sheets. We're splitting hairs at this point. I think that rule only applies when it's safe to do so. If you stay, no one will be here to stop the dead from getting inside the compound. Big Army can send a recovery team for remains. I think staying behind is far outside of our scope of responsibility at this point. Sergeant Crawford combed a few loose strands of hair back into her bun. I got kids, St. Clair. Miranda closed the gap between them and caught the woman just as she collapsed into sobs. I'm okay. It's not even the number of casualties. I can wrap my head around that, but this? This just can't be real. I can shoot an enemy. I can't re-kill my dead friend. What the actual fuck? In what, re in what world is this a reality? Miranda, are they even going to let us go home? While every word Sergeant Crawford spoke was candid and true, Miranda maintained her dutiful posture. She knew keeping her head in the fight would deliver her back to her baby. It had to. I'm going home. Not like this. She gestured at an occupied body bag. Come on, you can do this. And you're not staying behind. That's insane. If the dead don't get you, the enemy will close in on this place, no doubt. When they both were standing, Miranda offered the woman one more hug, though awkward in all of her gear. We have got to hold it together for these younger soldiers. If we're afraid, they will be too. We have to mask all this fear, okay? I know you know how to do that. If we march on fully confident in our abilities, and especially theirs, we can get every one of us home safely. We need each other, and it's the only way we're going to get out of here. We're going to see our babies again. The two women nodded to each other. As much as she felt like a brainwashed asshole taking all the military's forced doctrine to heart, it was truly the only common resolve they all had to keep going. It went against her motherly instincts not to comfort Sergeant Crawford in a more sensitive way, but mothers don't win battles. Soldiers do. If there was ever a lesson driven into her head, 
it was those two identities could not coexist at war. And that's it. Wow. Daisha, I can't wait to get this book. <laughs> I, I mean, I already own the Kindle version, but I want to get a paperback version oh, too. Awesome. Um, it's, I, like I said, I love zombies and I love what you're doing. <laughs> this is cool. So um, I already know, but other people might not. Where can they go find your book? Yeah, so you can find me anywhere. I'm a I'm a fast Google search away. It's Daisha M. Arnold, and Daisha is spelled D-A-C-I-A. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Daisha M. Arnold, and then my website, of course, is DaishaMArnold.com. Nice. So I always have this one question that I ask people before we go, but I've got two for you instead. <laughs> oh, no, um, okay. <laughs> uh, the first one is, what's one thing that you love about yourself that's not based on physical appearance? Hmm. Okay. Um, this is going to sound silly, but I made an entire career around it, is I absolutely love my story. Um, I love remembering these things that happen because it gives me – more perspective for where I am today. Um, a lot of people ask, what would you go back and change? And I wouldn't change a fucking thing. I wouldn't. I've been through the most horrible things that anyone could possibly go through. And um, I wouldn't take it back. I, it, it's helped me be the mother I am today. It's helped me to be the wife I am today. And it's helped me to be a, a friend and advocate and coach, um, to, to other people. If I could reach through this, this phone and give you a high five and a huge <laughs> hug, I absolutely totally would. <laughs> Thanks. High five. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And you ready for this one last question? Drum roll. Okay. Shoot. <laughs> Tell me about when Billy Zane asked for your <laughs> autograph. <laughs> So it's really, it's weird that, I don't know, people who are younger than us might not know who Billy Zane is. Um, Billy Zane was the um, boyfriend in Titanic. He was really mean. And then he's done other things. So he was in Demon Knight, um, which is Tales from the Crypt. And he was also in Zoolander, which oh, yeah. I, oh my God, I watched Zoolander over and Like guys in college would make fun of me and be like, day show once a Billy Zane Aroni. Like... <laughs> Oh my God, so hot. So uh, last year we attended a charity event in, in Williamsburg, Virginia called Scares That Care. And Billy Zane was like, the celebrity guest uh, like of honor. And so um, I'm not really big on getting pictures with people or getting autographs. So I just, you know, steered clear of that. I want to make people feel weird. Um, so I'm in the vendor room, like slumming it, the back of the bus, we're in the very back of the room, and I'm facing the back wall, and there is this man who's causing a ruckus on the floor, and it's like if somebody's, like, grandpa stumbled in, it's like, oh, what's going on here, you know, <laughs> and this big horror convention, and I was like, God, they really just let anyone come in here, and then he gets closer, and he's got this straw hat, he's got glasses on, a mask, um, and uh just this blue and white hawaiian shirt and uh i'm like oh sh shit that's billy zane walking around the vendor room and he comes up to my table and he's like oh what do you got here tell me about your book and i'm like ah oh, well and i tell him about everything and then he goes and takes his phone to take a picture of the book and he's like no no, no hang on and he hits record on his phone, holds it to my face, and says, now tell me about your books. And I'm like, blue, 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 blue. <laughs> so he's like, all right, I'm going to get this one. And I'm like, ah, oh, do you want me to just sign it or sign it to you? And he's like, no, sign it to me. And I'm like, oh, Billy Zane. <laughs> I don't know what to say. So I sign it and he pays cash, of course, and uh, I give it to him. And he's he picks up like every pamphlet piece of paper everything on the table shoves in the book he's like all oh, the 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 information's here you know for film rights and everything and I'm like uh-huh uh-huh but I don't give my phone number away. I own the rights to my book and I don't give these things my phone number away to people 
And so I'm thinking, like, after he leaves, Billy Zane's not going to go to my website and use the contact form to tell me that he wants to make a movie out of this. So then I have to... <laughs> I have to go back to the celebrity room and then wait in line with my business card with my contact information and I hand it to him. Bless his heart. He's like, I'm really excited to read it. I go, no, I'm excited. And then I just walk away. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and my husband's there this whole time. And like, I tell this story and I'm like, Billy Zane asked for my autograph and my phone number. And my husband would be like, stop telling it like that. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. It's like pretty, pretty high point in my career so far. So we're still waiting on uh, Billy Zane's people to call my people um, <laughs> about the, ad the film adaptation. But we're still holding on for that. Oh, that is awesome. That, that is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Zane. <laughs> it's a running joke now with all my friends that uh <laughs> Billy Zane bought my book. So when I was um in involved in human trafficking, I was trafficked three different times. One of them in particular, I leaned on some early childhood resources in order to get out. Um I wrote about it in detailed pieces of a shattered dream, but basically I thought to myself, what would MacGyver do? <laughs> yes. Oh my god. Oh, Richard Dean Anderson saved my life. I oh, wow. cannot stress that enough. I wrote to him several times through his fan club and he's never responded but I have to trust that he knows and yeah. I can't even imagine if Richard Dean Anderson <laughs> walked up to my booth and asked for my book <laughs> wow uh, yeah right goodness <laughs> Well, on that note, Daisha, this has been an absolute pleasure. You are amazing. And I hope we can get a lot of people going over and checking out your book and, and uh, uh, supporting you by grabbing either a Kindle version, a paperback version, or just grabbing a copy of your book um, today, Veterans Day, and help support you and to thank you for your service. And I know it's not Memorial Day, but to thank mm -hmm. your Staff Sergeant Peary also. Thank you. Yeah. What a cool person you are. I love it. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, and if you, next time you have a book coming out, give me a shout, let me know. And I would love to have you back on the show. We can talk about that one too. Oh, let's do it. All right. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate it. All right. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> Bye. Happy birthday, Mark Scopel. We miss you. I just wanted to leave you guys a quick note to let you know that next week we will not be returning in honor of Thanksgiving week. So we're just going to kind of take a little bit of a break here. Uh, my husband and I are going to be out of town, hopefully visiting family. So um, don't be looking for a podcast episode next week and we will return the week after. If you've enjoyed tonight's episode, make sure that you head on over and check out the episode description. You will find links on how you can both support this podcast and how you can actually follow this author on social media. Check out their website, find their books, find their blogs. Whatever it is that they provide me with is what I provide in the episode description. So check it out. Go support our people.